Thanks. Okay, I'll make an announcement once you've let everyone in. And Grace, you're sharing your screen, right? Yeah, I'll start it now. I'll give you control too. Okay. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the November 15th Public Design Commission meeting. We are having some technological uh, issues this morning, so I apologize for that. Uh, we will be recording this uh, meeting and posting it on YouTube as soon as we can. Uh, Signe, do you want to go ahead and start the meeting? Thank you, Carrie. Uh, good morning. My name is Signe Nielsen, President of the Public Design Commission. We will now begin the meeting with a roll call to confirm commissioner attendance. When I call your name, if you would please say here. Phil Ahrens. Here. Ken Seth Armstead. Here. Lori Hawkinson. Here. Deborah Martin. Here. Karen Keel. Here. Manuel Miranda. Here. Susan Morgenthau. Here. Ethel Sheffer. Here. Meryl Tisch. She on the phone, Karen? She's here, but she's still muted. Um, okay. But she's on the Zoom. Okay. Mary Valverde? She's not here today, sorry. All right. Uh, we will now commence uh, with a committee meeting. The first project on the agenda is the long-term loan of the statue of Thomas Jefferson from the City Council Chamber to the New York Historical Society. Design and Commission Executive Director Carrie Butler will make the presentation in, respo uh, in response to the condition of approval. Good morning, Commissioners. Um, at the October 18th Public uh, Design Commission hearing, uh, the Commission reviewed a proposal for the long-term loan of the statue of Thomas Jefferson from the City Council Chambers in City Hall to the New York Historical Society. This proposal is submitted by the Department of Citywide Administrative Services. At the October hearing, commissioners gave preliminary approval to the removal of the artwork from the city council chamber with the understanding that an appropriate location would be determined by the end of this year. Members noted the importance of public access and educational context for the artwork. Subsequent to that hearing with the generous a contribution of a trustee, the Historical Society was able to revise their proposal and is now offering to install the artwork on public display with interpretation that provides historical context. The statue would be installed in the first floor lobby of the museum for approximately six months. Uh, we've created a very rough rendering here. Uh, as you can see, there's a backdrop behind the piece that can be removed. So that would provide more visibility uh, to the statue from outside. Uh, and we are uh, told that this, the windows do have UV treatment to, for protection. So following this exhibition, the artwork would be moved to the library reading room. Again, a rough uh, rendering of the piece in situ. As you may know, the New York Historical Society is a nonprofit organization dedicated to fostering research and public discourse. To address some concerns about access to the artwork, the Historical Society has confirmed that it offers free admission on Friday, every Friday evening. It also offers free or nominal admission to more than 200,000 New York City school students and their teachers every year. The library reading room is free and open to the public, and no one is ever barred from the museum due to an inability to pay.
In response to recommendations from some historians, including a few members of the Conservation Advisory Group, that the artwork be installed in the governor's room of City Hall. We asked City Hall historian and tour program manager, Mary Beth Betts, to provide this timeline. So as you can see, the artwork was uh, donated to the, to the city 64 years before the art commission was established. And it had several locations within the building. PDC staff studied installing the artwork in the governor's room and did not find it ideal due to a lack of space and circulation concerns. I also wanna note that the PD staff in coordination with the Department of Citywide Administrative Services manages the governor's room and does not have the resources to provide the same level of care, contextualization and education that the historical society can give to this artwork. The city hall, uh, city hall excuse me, is not typically open to the public on the weekends or in the evenings. And the governor's room is only open uh, to the public on scheduled tours. I do wanna remind commissioners, that this was a long-term loan. Um, this artwork would still be uh, in the city's art collection and it could be returned uh, to the city or to an another appropriate location with the commission's approval um, and adequate notice. Please let me know if you have any questions. Thank you. Commissioners, any uh, comments or uh, questions? Okay, thank you. Um, I just want to say that uh, I really uh, greatly appreciate uh, the New York Historical Society for offering this unique opportunity uh, to contextualize and elucidate the artwork and providing a platform for public discourse about how the artwork, Jefferson and Levy fit into the history of New York and the country. And very much appreciate that this will be in the public realm as we uh, mentioned that was critical at our last meeting. Uh, this, uh, barring any uh, comments or um, objections from commissioners, this is being put on the consent agenda for later today. Okay, uh, next we will hear a presentation on the Union Square Master Plan. Um, Ed, let me give you control. Uh, did we unmute it? Yes, it's unmuted. Okay. okay. Uh, thank you, Signe and uh, Carrie and Jenna and Grace and Public Design Commission for having me today. My name is Ed Janoff and I am the Deputy Director and Chief of Staff of the Union Square Partnership BID um, and the design lead on this project. Joining me today, uh, who won't be speaking, are uh, our Executive Director Jen Falk and Planning Director Tally Cantor and members of uh, Marvel, who was the architect consultant on this project, uh, Guido Hartre and Ishida Gar. Um, I will be speaking very quickly, given 10 minutes on this non-voting item, um, and trust that you've had a chance to review this and give us any feedback. Um, I'll start by saying that this is, um, in, in the agenda, this was mentioned as, it was listed as a uh, master plan for the reconstruction of the park, but just to clarify, this is really a, a vision plan, a, a really a preconceptual plan um, for the broader neighborhood, um, inclusive of the park. And I'll speak more about that. Um, a little bit into the presentation. Um, we are the bid in the neighborhood who provides a lot of the uh, cleaning services, but also do a lot of designing and planning and stewardship work. Um, and that includes shown on the right, we were uh, heavily involved in the 2012 uh, design and reconstruction of the North End and restoration of the park pavilion. Um, I trust I don't need to orient members of the commission to Union Square, um, but I show this slide just as an opportunity to express that we really approach this space, um, not with a, an intent to, um, you know, completely reimagine it, but rather with a strong deference to its historical um, significance, to its, uh, you know, it being a really important heart space for New Yorkers and really uh, an internationally important public space. And so we um, try as much as possible to respond uh, to and accommodate all the existing uses and features. Um, and just for your edification, these are the boundaries of our bid from 1st Avenue to 6th Avenue and then the properties immediately around the park. 
Um, Union Square is a neighborhood that uh, prior to the pandemic was on a very strong upward trajectory with a lot of foot traffic increases. And um, we mentioned that it is a uh, mixed use neighborhood with a two to one ratio of office workers to residents, which is fairly uh, rare, that particular ratio in, in, in New York City. I think, you know, a little bit further north, it's much more office workers, a little bit further south, it's much more residents. And um, that that ratio mixed with the, you know, the transit density that's really specific to New York City subway lines, I think is part of what gives the street life. It's really a New Yorker's New York character and informs much of um, what we would be doing with the design. Um, and also there's a, a lot of ongoing mixed use private investment in the neighborhood. This project was really a community engagement project with an urban design outcome. Um, it is the largest engagement effort in the partnership's 40 year history um, with many thousands of community members engaged and these types of pop up engagements, uh, you know, in the green market, at bus stops, subway stations, in hotel lobbies. And really what we were trying to do here is uh, establish a set of goals and design values to to guide the development of the neighborhood's public realm into the future. And what we'll show in terms of renderings are some, you know, inspirational ideas for how these different uh, choices could manifest um, in terms of the urban design. Um, I don't need to go through all of the public feedback, but some of the highlights are that people really wanted to emphasize transit connections, uh, pedestrian safety and pedestrian mobility, public space, uh, greening, and a really important idea, which was to take the public space and, and park benefits of Union Square and, and try to deliver that out more broadly to the neighborhood around. Um, we're also through the design analysis looking at, you know, you've got the Broadway corridor, which is increasingly becoming uh, pedestrianized, the 14th Street busway, which was installed in 2019, that intersects Broadway here. Um, you've got the, you know, New York City DOT doing more plazas and shared streets. Um, you've got the Parks Department doing uh, Parks Without Borders. So, you know, you've got one agency who controls the streets doing more public space, one agency that does public space, uh, emphasizing, you know, more connectivity with the, with the neighborhood around. Um, and Union Square, I think, has historically been a kind of a gray area between the, the, the border between parks and DOT. Um, and the purpose here is to think about moving forward, um, how can we make all these things uh, relate to each other and unite in terms of a design vocabulary. <clears throat> um, and so we arrived at this uh, narrative vision for Union Square, which is to uh, really emphasize its transit and pedestrian features and to make it a diverse and welcoming space, emphasizing accessibility, um, not just in terms of accessibility for people that have difficulty walking, but um, really access to the neighborhood, um, to the educational resources and food resources and, and art resources, all of that um, in Union Square. And we put together these uh, sort of soft goals about emphasizing pedestrian use, access and connectivity, open space, um, also some things that are somewhat unique to Union Square, which are um, acknowledging and accommodating its use as a space for uh, demonstration and free expression. And also the very, um, uh, you know, the, all the unique expressive uh, performances, et cetera, that happen um, in Union Square, both above ground and below ground, and making sure that that continues to be one of the distinctive features of the area, along with historic preservation, and uh, community health and ground floor activation. Another interesting part of the analysis was trying to take a look at the design evolution of Union Square. Um, it was master planned in the Olmsted and Vox era um, and originally had this sort of more romantic design and was very much uh, gated off um, and a kind of bucolic separation from the city. And um, you know, in the latter part of the 19th century, you see the city starts to really rapidly grow up around Union Square Park and you get clanging trolley cars. And then by the 20s and 30s, it's um, functioning sort of as a traffic circle surrounded by parking and is master planned again in the Moses era to include um, really now um, traffic islands at the uh, southern corners of the park. 
Um, but then in the 70s, you have the advent of the green market, which utilizes that parking for public space um, on a you know, pop-up basis. And that starts to drive not a full master plan, but really a series of mini plans that occur in the 80s and 90s and 2000s, which build out that uh, parking area around the park now into public space for permanent use by the green market and other types of seasonal and temporary activations. Then uh, after the north side reconstruction in 2012, and sort of concurrently, you have DOT starting to make some elaborate temporary material changes to the streets around the park, uh, bike lanes, shared streets, plazas, uh, Union Square West becomes much more pedestrianized. And we believe that the you know, natural evolution of that thrust would be to really make the space between buildings in all of the square be one a coherent and harmonious public space through which vehicles are more guests than, um, than priority. So Marvel, um, to try to wrap their heads around how we could try to uh, come up with an urban design expression of these values, try to divide the work into five distinct projects, which are listed here, um, looking at Union Square West as one space, looking at the uh, Broadway, receiving the, the Broadway pedestrian street as another space, um, really trying to take a close look at the Triangle Park, which um, today is somewhat disconnected from the rest of Union Square, and then thinking of 14th Street as, uh, its, as its own space um, as sort of a transit boulevard. Um, park infrastructure is not, oh, I'm sorry, um, is not something that was designed. And um, we just mentioned this in the vision to say that this is um, in need of a new master plan. A lot of the 40 year old um, kind of infrastructure in the park, the, the electrical and plumbing is starting to fall apart. It um, needs a new kind of master plan from scratch. Uh, we certainly wouldn't expect to change uh, dramatically the design or character of the park, but there are certainly some um, aspects of the you know, pathways and landscaping, which could be tweaked to accommodate differences in the way the park is used now versus the last time um, it was planned. So it sort of just becomes a uh, laundry list of needs for the things that we would want to look at um, in doing a master plan of the park. Um, the preserving the historic tree canopy, looking at the subway entrances as this is mainly just a roof over the subway um, and addressing some of the different um, landscape and, uh, you know, uh, amenity features of the park. Um, but then moving on to Union Square West, I show this slide because it really expresses what I think is what we're trying to address here um, in terms of the paving. Um, if you look at the paving from left to right, it really tells the story of the incremental uh, development of the area around the park. You see almost every kind of standard paving in New York City's catalog um, from you know, concrete to granite slab, to an asphalt bike lane, to cobblestone, to a asphalt paver furniture zone, to bluestone pavers, to standard park hex pavers. And that, that, that conveys the, the need for this whole area to have one cohesive um, design at one time. Um, and so in the inspirational rendering, um, Marvel shows this as one continuous at grade um, experience with a single paving, um, in this case, um, showing um, Parks Department hex paving as one possible choice, um, and then activating ground floor retail, introducing plantings, um, and introducing a raised planter element that could address some of the concerns about um, you know, not getting good longevity from the trees around the park today because of various things that um, are hurting the trees and introducing a raised element um, that could not only protect those plantings, but also um, provide seeding. Um, moving to uh, sort of an aerial view, you can see how Union Square West would be diminished to essentially just a driveway access for that side of the park. And we're showing the idea of graduating the green market from temporary infrastructure as it exists today to some kind of maybe permanent but flexible use and providing a large new subway entrance here at 16th Street. On Broadway, similar idea. This is the temporary DOT plaza, which could now have some kind of a, a unified paving with the park surrounds and um, you know, welcoming that transition from Broadway now into Union Square. And, um, always providing some kind of security features around the public space. 
Um, and here it is on an aerial of 14th Street facing west. Um, you can see the idea that all of 14th Street um, on both sides could continue to have some kind of unified paving with the park. And um, in responding to the public idea of having the park provide uh, open space benefit to the rest of the community, you see a literal response to that where you have um, taking these uh, radial paving elements and actually sending them out in all directions to the building edges. And in this case, using this planter element um, to follow the semicircular arc of the South Plaza, which is in front of the George Washington statue, the oldest major monument in the Parks Department's collection. Um, here on ground level on 14th Street, um, you see the way that this could be experienced at eye level um, with some kind of unified paving and the radial elements. And the planter here could be used in place of bollards as a security feature. And then finally, I'll show, um, there, it is, there it is an axon showing the potential of um, this kind of treatment continuing down University Place, which is a shared street and could actually continue the pedestrian environment of Broadway down to Washington Square Park. Um, finally, the Triangle Plaza, which sits in some ways across from Union Square, um, you can see there's a strong pedestrian desire line that today is not honored um, to go through it into the park. And today it is sort of a um, uh, kind of a underutilized and, and uh, dusty zone that could in the future introduce a pathway through it, preserving all the trees and um, providing a mixed seating of all types. And here you see 14th Street on your left. Uh, finally, the project also include, oh, and this could include, a, you know, a physical connection of that triangle to the rest of Union Square Park with um, significant traffic implications to be explored later. And then finally, uh, Marvel also provided a kit of parts approach to a streetscape that would apply um, potentially to the rest of the district, 14th Street and on the side streets around Union Square Park has a number of these elements that are typical in this kind of a toolkit approach. Um, and uh, you can see here, um, seating um, is really an important emphasis, even more important following COVID. We understand the value of outdoor seating of all kinds. And here's sort of a closer examination of this um, elevated planter bench uh, unit, which you see, you know, it's not the kind of necessarily uh, continuous seat wall you see in some plaza designs today, but more of a repeatable element like you might be seeing uh, maybe in meatpacking or in Fordham Plaza. Um, and is also meant to relate to the sort of unique people watching uh, experience of the Union Square South Plaza steps. And could you take that um, experience and replicate that uh, throughout the neighborhood? We also looked at potentially coming up with a, uh, you know, a parklet design, a, these kind of micro parks along the curb lane throughout the neighborhood in a design that could be standardized and also relate to the work that we're doing um, around the park. And we're also working with Marvel on coming up with potentially a prototype for a waste management container in the curb lane. Um, security features we know will be a really um, challenging and complicated part of this design. Um, we this 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 is really just to say that the intent would be to provide some kind of security defense for the pedestrian spaces and public spaces around Union Square Park to evolve the kind of granite blocks that are around there today into something more permanent. Um, but that is something also that will need certainly more um, you know detailed exploration with a, trying to de-emphasize the, the bollard effect that we've seen um, in other signature public spaces in Manhattan. Um, and then we're also um, asking to have a lighting plan that would standardize the four or five different uh, street lights that you see on 14th Street, looking at um, making sure that all of the uh, pedestrian lighting in the park works together and introducing potentially down lighting um, from buildings, if that makes sense, um, for the public spaces to give them a nice soft wash around the park. And then also we think facade lighting of some of the beautiful structures around the park could be a really great opportunity area to um, beautify the neighborhood. Um, and then to public art, a temporary public art will continue to be an effort of the partnership and we're exploring places where it might make sense to establish uh, sort of rotating uh, positioning. Um, See, just going to move on here. 
um, as we're kind of low on time, there's a kind of quick implementation plan at the back of the document, which you can see on our website, um, tries to organize all of this work and prioritize it. And um, we have re launched this vision plan earlier this year, done a number, I think close to a dozen different community presentations to get feedback on what we've um, already put out there. We've done a presentation to all our community boards and a number of focus groups. Um, we've heard that people are excited about the idea of moving all of the temporary work of Union Square into a permanent feature. And some of the feedback we've heard is that people would really like to see, in particular, more greening, more trees than we've shown um, in these renderings, and think a lot about um, how this works with the uh, programming that happens in the park. Um, we have started to implement some of these uh, some of the vision in temporary features, such as doing a mural along the busway. We're looking at doing parklets. We're looking at an economic impact study, a traffic study. We are starting the uh, tree plan with an arborist and um, joining us today, um, or at least we'll be watching the recording of Star White House, who has been hired to do a master plan, a conceptual master plan for the streetscape, which follows from the kit of parts a streetscape elements chapter is one of the first things that we think that we are capable of doing in terms of all this whole work in the vision plan, which quite honestly could be um, 10 to 20 years and uh, with a nine figure price tag. Um, so as I said, uh, Star White House starting work on a street furniture plan, really looking at um, off the shelf items that we could use to um, start to uh, realize the, uh, the ambitions of the street elements chapter in the, in the vision. So thank you for this opportunity. Um, really, really welcome any feedback you have because there's so much, um, you know, so much to do in terms of taking this vision, this preconceptual into conceptual projects. Um, and and thank you for your time. Um, thank you very much. Uh, it's an impressive uh, body of work. Uh, congratulations to Marvel and all the other team members. Um, I'm very pleased to see your uh, efforts to try to consolidate uh, street furniture planting uh, along with security measures. And uh, I would just, I guess, urge you to keep uh, going in that trajectory uh, to try to solve some of the uh, concerns about additional greening. I recognize uh, you are um, virtually on hollow ground uh, in a lot of your uh, area because of the subways. Uh, so that may um, unfortunately have to be uh, the strategy that you um, deploy, but um, it's a tough road, but uh, I think you're on a very good path. Uh, other commissioners care to comment? I, I, I wanna say this is very exciting to see uh, master vision start to come to shape for Union Square. Uh, and I am, of course, excited that there will be temporary artworks planned and continued throughout Union Square. Uh, but I would also like to just offer that the addition of another site for a permanent uh, artwork uh, could add to both the value civically and the cultural life of the neighborhood. Because the temporary works, obviously, you get a lot of excitement. And uh, but the whole park is sort of centered on George Washington. And there's no problem with that in general, uh, but uh, there's a lack of uh, public art considering the, the, the numbers of diverse communities in New York. There's a lack of permanent work that reflect in the public space uh, that diversity. And so this is a great opportunity when doing this whole plan to actually uh, achieve uh, a way to communicate the diversity of New York. Uh, and uh, there's going to be more space in the park. I mean, the, the overall vision is to grow the park. And so in doing so, I think uh, finding a way to find a permanent artwork uh, would be interesting. And then also because, I mean, I, I was there once and uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez had a, a, a protest there uh, uh, and Frequently, people gather there 20,000, 40,000 at a time. Uh, and every time we're putting something permanent there, we're having a way to communicate the goals, the vision, the ethics, the mores of the city. 
two people. Uh, and George Washington is definitely a part of that. Uh, but and, and, and is there a, a there's a Gandhi that's permanent in there as well. And but uh, there is a distinct lack. And I know that there's a plan to do She Built NYC. Uh, there, are, there are women of note in the history of New York. There are people of color of note in the history of New York. And there are uh, many different ways to approach uh, in, engaging this site. Uh, and I, so I would put that forward as something to consider street strongly. Uh, thank you for that. We've, we have conveyed the same to our partners at the Parks Department and their Arts and Antiquities program who are joining us today. We think that's a really great opportunity for the future. Uh, other commissioners? I think it's I think it's a really exciting plan. I really I recently moved to the area, and so there are moments of continuity, like say University or University Place, just south of Fourteenth Street, where it feels like a continuous experience from the street to the sidewalks. So I think more of that would be really great to see. And you know I like I think all the plans around public art, uh, programming, what Ken Seth just said. You know it really works towards you know you know, with the design and the activation, you know, really making this a kind of like public space. So I think that's really great to see too. Thank you. Great. Uh, anyone else? Uh, this will be on the consent agenda uh, later today. Um, actually, this, um, I'm sorry if that was in your script signing that this is not on the today's oh, consent sorry. agenda. Oh, sorry, terribly sorry. Um, uh, we will be coming back with the conceptual design for the street furniture plan uh, with Star White House um, probably in, we're anticipating uh, late winter. Maybe the next time you'll see us. All right, thank you very much. We really appreciate your presentation and uh, all of the work that's gone into it. Um, so we're now going to move on <clears throat> to our next committee meeting item, which is the construction of a garden shed at the Edgemere Coalition Community Garden in Queens. Please feel free to start. Thank you. Um, let's um, unmute Jaffer and I'll give him control. Um, I believe Carlos Martinez will also give an introduction from Parks. So if you could unmute him too. Jaffer, just give me one minute. Okay, I've given you control. Good morning, everyone. I want to thank President Nielsen, Executive Director Butler, and PDC Commissioners for having us here today. My name is Carlos Martinez. I'm the Director of Greentom, the Community Gardening Program of the New York City Parks Department. Greentom is the largest urban gardening program in the nation, assisting over 20,000 volunteer gardeners and supporting more than 550 community gardens. Combined, that's 100 acres of publicly accessible open space. Today, I'm joined by our colleagues from New Affiliates to present to the Planning Design Commission the proposal of test beds. For the past three years, Greentham has been working very closely with New Affiliates in the research and design of test beds, an initiative to repurpose architectural mockups into creative structures in community gardens. During this process, we have collectively engaged the community members of the, gar of the Garden by the Bay formerly known as Edgemere Coalition Community Garden in the borough of Queens. Greentham is in full support of this proposal as it aligns with our community development model and the open space mission of NYC Parks. Now, I'd like to introduce Jaffer Kolb from New York Affiliates to further elaborate on this proposal. Uh, thank you, Carlos. Uh, thank you to the commissioners for giving us the platform and the time to present the project today. Uh, my name is Joffer, as Carlos mentioned. I'm uh, a co-principal of the architecture office, New Affiliates, based in New York. My design partner, Evie Diamantapu, is also on the call, but won't be speaking today. Uh, so thanks for giving us an opportunity to kind of present some of the thinking of this project and the design as well. Um, Making sure, okay, there we go. Uh, so our project, just making sure I can control, our project began with an observation that architectural mockups are a significant wasted resource within our profession. Uh, it began with actually an observation specifically about mockups that we saw in and around the city. Mockups tend to be done for both performance and visual assessment and study. They're typically made of the same building components as the building themselves. So they're a one-to-one -one scale model. Apologies for the siren outside the window. I hope it's not too distracting. Um, 
they're typically made to assess uh, sort of a, a part of the building itself. They cost anywhere from one to three or four hundred thousand dollars to make. They're made out of all real materials, steel, glass, aluminum, concrete, masonry, etc. And after review, they're thrown away. And we thought that was a real problem. And we wanted to find a way to kind of think through them a little bit more. We went on a few tours of uh, sites, construction companies, testing facilities where they produced and looked at architectural mockups. This one is from Island Construction out in Long Island. We lovingly referred to these as mock-up graveyards. Uh, what was interesting about going to these sites is that we realized that the buildings, as we sort of assumed, really were quite rigid and well-built fragments. And what we found is that in speaking to the people who were constructing them and testing them, that they actually could find use in a kind of second life. Uh, so we felt vindicated in sort of our early assumptions about the project. And so we began to wonder what if mock-ups could have a second life. Wandering around the city, we were struck by a kind of interesting resonance between the mock-ups themselves and the small structures. It's an endless array of sirens, apologies again. Uh, and a resonance in the scale of small garden structures in the community gardens around the city. Um, so things like casitas, tool sheds, greenhouses, and other small facilities had a real kind of scale comparison to the mock-ups that we found exciting and possibly interesting. And so we used these two structures to kind of think about creating new life cycles within the kind of design profession. So in this case, a diagram sort of revealing, uh, taking a fragment of design and transposing it as a kind of urban link into the gardens around the city, thus actually keeping it out of the metaphor metaphorical dustbin and trying to think through reuse instead of waste. At the same time, we were working closely with Green Thumb to identify an appropriate garden in the city that we might work with. Green Thumb very generously introduced us to many gardeners. And in the end, we found a great conversation with the Edgemere Coalition Community Garden um, out in the Rockaways. So this is a kind of image of the project showing where the reused mock-up will go, which I'll walk through in a little bit more detail in a moment. So this is a rendering of the structure that we are intending to build. Um, the structure, the mock-up itself comes from this uh, 14 story condominium building in Tribeca called 30 Warren by the developer Cape Advisors. Uh, it was fabricated by a company in Pennsylvania called Tactile. The mock up comprises four custom cast concrete panels and a large 10 by 5 foot window. It was originally used in their showroom, actually, but it was meant to test some of the visual properties of the concrete panels as they were fabricating them. The developer has donated the panel to us, the mock-up to us, and also uh, donated its storage. So it's actually been sitting, waiting for us for the past year and a half while we worked through COVID-related delays, as well as trying to get all of the appropriate um, permissions from the city. Uh, the, the link that we're trying to make is actually between Tribeca and uh, where the garden is located in the Rockaways. The Edgemere Coalition Community Garden has been like a great partner to talk through. Uh, we've collaborated with them very closely on trying to determine the best use for the mock-up and a type of structure that would most um, happily benefit them. So here's a little bit of site context. The garden is just off of uh, to the east of Beach 43rd Street. It's wide open as a site, which is maybe a little bit less similar to some of the community gardens that you see around um, Lower Manhattan, for example, that have buildings around them or trees. This one is really open to the elements. And so one of the things the gardeners wanted was a little bit more protection, uh, which is partly what led to our design. So in terms of the design itself, the structure is made up of three small uh, enclosed building units. So on the left, you see here, this is foundation plan, the floor plan and a roof plan. So looking at the floor plan, the left structure, that diagonal wall, which my hand is currently hovering over, is where the mock-up is installed. And this is what we're calling just a community room, but essentially it's a place for, um, you know, a couple people to gather during, you know, inclement weather, uh, store things, hold little one-to-one -one, um, meetings or conversations or even small classes. On the right, you see a greenhouse and a storage unit. Each one of these small components is under 150 square feet. Um, so they're all quite small, but they're bound together by a roof that hovers over all of them that provides shade and a kind of open trellis structure. So here, the conversation with the gardeners really led to a structure that both had many small parts that they could use, but also provided a lot of shade, which is simply something that they really need and want the garden currently. Um, 
I won't go into too much detail about the construction, uh, but basically each of the buildings is treated semi-autonomously, so they each have their own foundation. Uh, it's all made out of very simple off-the-shelf uh, wood framing. We've been working with an engineer, Silman, um, one of the city's largest engineers who's giving services to the project pro bono to make sure that we're specifying all the correct member sizes so that everything is secure. Obviously, this is in a sensitive region. It's near Edgemere and the Rockaways, and we want to make sure that it would be safe in you know, inclement weather hurricanes, wind, high-speed wind events, and we feel confident in our conversations with the, with the engineer that all of that has been considered and met. Uh, here again, you see the mock-up kind of facing this community room on the right side as well, and a sense of the structure. In terms of the location of the garden itself, we've situated the structure in the bottom left corner, as you can see here on the site plan. Um, so the main entry is here at the number five, and the structure will be just to the left. It's sort of nestled in. Um, it's held minimum six feet off the lot line and the front lot line, so side and front, um, but we didn't want to get in the way of the gardeners. And again, this was done in conversation with them. Um, the top part of the garden is planter beds that are kind of actively used and maintained currently. The bottom right is an herb and flower garden that's already been developed. And just above that is a small garden shed. So we wanted to make sure that whatever we proposed wouldn't get in the way, but also gave them um, something that wasn't currently at the garden. For us, the project has a lot of really interesting sort of conceptual um, byproducts. One of them is thinking about the, the role of the window itself, the connection between high-end luxury housing uh, and community garden structures, which feel like they operate both, you know, in the air and on the ground, addressing different uses, programs, community values, et cetera, and to try and find a kind of commonality between them. This project is considered as a pilot project for what we're hoping will evolve into a much larger initiative. Um, we really want to use as many mock-ups as possible. We see them again as this huge wasted resource. And of course, there are gardens all over the city, as Carlos mentioned, between five and 600, um, many of which are in need of some kind of community structure. Uh, so we're hoping that if this goes well, and if you know everything uh, is sort of happily accepted by the community that this can can move on and create all of these kind of linkages between the city's uh, highest areas of development so mock-ups are usually made for much higher end buildings and the community gardens that tend to be uh, in other parts of the city so there's this almost like ambassadorial quality to them um, just to finish out we launched the project uh, sort of just informally a year ago and we're immediately met with a lot of great press so we feel great about the positive reaction the gardeners have been wonderful to work with here uh, the photograph on the right shows our team which includes our construction company us um, some of the gardeners and the garden leadership and between the great press and the gardeners just being really excited about the project we feel really good about going into building this and we feel confident that it will be at well um, our team including uh, the pro bono engineer we talked about and parks also includes the architectural league of new york which is our fiscal sponsor um, and other companies so i'll leave it there thank you again so much for your time and let us know any questions thank you for that a very a creative concept, and uh, I applaud you for that. Uh, I, I certainly have been uh, part of many mock-ups in my life, and it is kind of tragic to just see them either fall apart or get dismantled and go into the waste stream. So uh, I think this is a, a very exciting um, initiative. Uh, commissioners, do you have any uh, questions or comments for the applicant? Um, I do. Um, first of all, I just want to say to Carlos and Green Thumb that I really applaud your uh, welcoming this kind of experimentation in our community gardens, because um, as you mentioned, I think it was 110 acres under management of Green Thumb, and that's really uh, an incredible asset that we have as a city that could be used for uh, for so many things, and, and this is a really exciting um, um, foray into that that looking at our community garden spaces as spaces for uh, gathering and experimentation um, that couldn't happen in city parks. So I think that's just terrific. Um, and Jaffer, so my question for you is um, this approach, given that each uh, um, mock-up is different in materiality, in construction, in uh, utility, like each one will be needed to uh, adapt uh, to specific site conditions. And uh, like you mentioned in Edgemere, there's like the wind issue, that kind of thing. Um, 
is is new affiliates planning a sort of an ongoing uh, movement or like a relationship to this because for example like gar community gardens and i'm sure carlos could speak to this tend to have very um varying levels of of governance and resources some are very stable and others are change every couple of years um and so my concern would be like uh, uh twofold one how does this particular structure get managed and maintained over time and then second uh if this is the start of a kind of ongoing collaboration with green thumb in a program um how is that resource given that each one will be uh essentially unique yeah thank you so much for the question deborah um very well put and you've identified something we think about a lot so i'll address a few questions um maybe from the smaller scale to the larger scale the smaller scale question which is how does this particular structure get maintained by the community garden uh that is one that came up in a lot of our conversations not just with this garden but with other gardens that we talked to in previous attempts at this project you know some of which didn't end up working out um which is that Community garden structures historically since the 70s need to be not just maintained, but actually oftentimes augmented by the garden as it kind of evolves and grows. And so that's why the materiality that we are bringing to the table, the wood framing, polycarbonate paneling, everything that we are introducing to kind of build around the mock-up is stuff that the gardeners can manipulate can transform if they need to in small ways over time can like fix a window here add a member there if they need to they're all materials that can be sourced from like home depot or lowe's or whatever so we always wanted to produce something that was both very sturdy and safe and engineered but also one that could actually evolve with the garden um, in small ways as they needed to and that becomes a, a really important part of all of our conversations with the garden. So to be honest with you, we didn't really think about that when we first started this project, but in discussing with several gardens, we realized that there was an urgency to what I'll just call manipulability in these structures, and we wanted to introduce that in the design. So that for sure is part of our approach here. Uh, your second question about the kind of bigger scale, you know, I don't want you to all think that this is like a kind of new affiliates branded proprietary project where we need to be involved in every project and hopefully what we can do eventually is set up some kind of like 501c3 or something where we can include other design partners who can participate in the systemic angle of this project. That said, it will always have to be a question of the mock-up itself, the garden itself. This is not a top-down project. It's really important to us that it's bottom up and that each design project is treated independently and discreetly. So while we want it to grow and happen all over the city, we also don't feel comfortable saying like, you know, we're gonna make this systemic so that there's some algorithm or set of rules that will generate the right project for the right garden. I think it will always require a kind of designer to interface between the community and the mock-up itself. I hope that answered your question. Sorry if it was a long, long-winded response. No, no, it, it did. And it was, it was a great answer. Thank you. And I guess I would just add that I encourage you um, to work with Green Thumb and the leadership of that particular garden to maybe supply them with a kind of uh, maintenance plan slash kit of parts, you know, like these are the size, you know, pieces of things that we got from Home Depot. This is like the item number that will be enormous uh, help to them over time when you've had to move on to other projects. But I, I really applaud both Green Thumb and new affiliates for this, this initiative. Thank you, Deborah. Um, any other commissioners care to weigh in? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to add that I think it's a really terrific project, and I applaud you know both Green Thumb and the architects and the architects for initiating this on their own. Um, and I, it, it's great to hear how you see it's it's maybe it's life going forward in a more open way, and it seems like a great opportunity to involve young architecture firms in kind of learning how to work in the city and in presenting to agencies like this and that, you know, that we're very open to this kind of innovation. So I thank you for uh, your care and thought and design expertise that you're sharing here. Thank you. Thank you. I wanted to ask one question about, um, so is there a database of all of the the follies that get made toward these buildings. No, <laughs> that that as a resource, I think, is a very valuable thing from what it is that you're doing moving forward. So, like, if buildings are made and there are the mock-ups that are made, 
if as they're being done, they're entered into a database, that is a resource that is invaluable. And then I'm going to another level where uh, you need another kind of partner. Like um, there's a thing called materials for the arts mm -hmm. and they work with, and so essentially you're creating a psychic material for the arts and a material base that other people, not just designers and not just parks. So like beyond the scope of finding a, a detailed use for the material for a park, it could also be that an artist and you, you know, you're providing this other kind of service as well. So I'm not trying to say that you should change your mission in any way, just that um, the, you know, opening that door means that that whole room has to be kind of explored. And I think uh, part of this mission may be creating this database or, uh, and, and it could be as simple as possible so that people could, when they make these mock-ups, put them onto a website so people can see them. And there's no real maintenance attached to that, but that part will one, be inspirational to other architects, B, be inspiration to artists. Uh, and then with the city, both temporary and permanent public artworks, most artists don't even know the breadth of materials that people use. And this would be kind of encyclopedic to that to that end because when artists are coming from their studios, almost everything artists do in their studios for galleries and museums is the opposite when they go to public. But you would be creating this thing where people could sort of see how it is that people are conceiving things that essentially you're making uh, sculptures. They're not gonna be used, they're follies and they are quite interesting. I, so as objects, I wonder if that's something you could uh, pursue. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. Thank you. Uh, the only other X factor in it is uh, the database is contingent on how long each of these companies is willing to store the mock-up for, which is a big part of the problem. So the other partner we need is a massive storage facility somewhere. <laughs> but, but even if they weren't going to store them, if you had the database and you had the catalog of the materials and what it was, it's yeah. still a propulsive idea yeah, and absolutely. creating and generating. So. Thank you. I think Signe may be frozen. Oh. Uh, you good there, Jenna? Yeah, I think your video froze for a second, but oh, I can sorry. hear you again. Okay, sorry. Um, so our last committee item is the construction of a tactical training facility at Rodman's Neck in the Bronx. Um, Commissioner Hawkinson is recused from this item and so she will be uh, leaving the meeting. Uh, presenters, please feel free to commence. Thank you, Sydney. Um, let's unmute Alex and is either Amir Eldon or Anthony Andreano from NYPD here for an intro? Good morning. It looks like we have Dean at Agnostos. I'm looking through the... Is he, can he give the intro? Let's, looking through the let's list. Let's unmute Dean and ask if he'd like to give the intro. Ah, oh, there we go. Oh, sorry, everyone. Hi, my name is Joe Nataro. I'm the commanding officer of facilities for the NYPD. I am here with Amara Eldon, Anthony Andriano, and Dean Anagnostos. Anagnostos. I have a hard time pronouncing <laughs> Dean's last name, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, so, you know, we're very excited. Uh, as you know, we've been trying to get this project uh, up off the ground for quite some time. We thought the project was dead a couple of years ago, to be quite honest with you. And then lo and behold, it's been uh, brought back to life. You know, we've been at Robin's Neck since 1960, which is a really long time. And obviously that place has basically been unchanged over the years. Um, in 1993, there was alienation legislation that actually uh, gave us uh, that particular portion of the Pelham, Pelham Bay Park uh, to operate as a training facility, also for other agencies, as long as it was um, <clears throat> training related or law enforcement related, we could uh, operate there in perpetuity. Um, we, it serves approximately 100,000 uniform members each year uh, for training, whether it's uh, the height of building or the firearms and tactics. Uh, the new facility is definitely going to show the highest quality of training uh, by providing state-of-the-art equipment and targeting systems. 
Uh, we're going with the 150 indoor shooting points that allow for tactical training. Uh, we'll have a new mess hall, locker rooms, uh, new ammo and storage buildings. And obviously this is also gonna help out uh, the community because for a really long time, obviously they've been complaining about the noise that uh, the firearms and tactics range produces in that area. Uh, and we've worked tirelessly to try to get these points indoors. And I think we've done a really good job in doing that. So I think that's where we are and just kind of, kind of what we're trying to accomplish. And uh, I guess I'll turn it over to DDC at that point. Yeah, I'll take it from here. Um, my name is Alex Mann. I'm with Smith Miller and Hawkinson Architects. I have both Lindsay Smith from Smith Miller and Hawkinson and Stephen Ladoughty from Langan, who is our landscape architect. Uh, we are pleased to be a part of this project to provide a much needed new space to enhance important NYPD training. And thank you to all members of the PDC and its commissioners for having us today. Uh, so I'll go sh shorter on my uh, summary as Nataro uh, gave a fantastic uh, brief. Uh, but one thing to keep in mind is, you know, this is an active training facility for the NYPD uh, where officers will need to train at this site twice per year. Um, which offers a unique design challenge as it must mean the site must uh, remain fully occupied uh, and operational during its construction. So we're working with our design team to develop a careful phasing strategy to bring the new facilities while maintaining the existing operations. Uh, let's hopefully this works. Okay, I'm clicking. There we go. There we go. Uh, the, the site is located on a peninsula in Pelham Bay Park in the Bronx. It is within the furthest northern limit of New York City. In a much closer proximity, the site is adjacent to City Island and the neighboring country club and Pelham Bay communities in the Bronx. Like many locations in New York City, the site is subject to raising water and the potential for flood. These are existing conditions we're working with our team to uh, accommodate. The site features limited access. The nearest subway line is a 10 minute drive to the peninsula. Um, access to the site is through the Pelham Bay Park. Um, a traffic circle redirects officers uh, towards the facility. So here's a Google Earth image of the existing facilities and the existing site. Uh, there's outdoor firing ranges and a modular training campus. Uh, we'll go more into a program view. So there's a, a number of operations that are existing on site as uh, Nataro described. We have the Haida Tactical Village, the Bomb Squad and Detonation Facilities, uh, the DOC Training Range. There's a, a portion of Department of Corrections firearms trainings at this site, as well as the majority of the site, which is the firearms and tactics classrooms and outdoor firing ranges. Uh, the existing circulation to these flow, to these buildings is scattered. Uh, the, it's, it's not a centralized system, which we're hoping to accommodate within our design. So some of the existing views, uh, you can see that uh, uh, there's a lot of site uh, standing water, which is due to limited site drainage on the site. Additionally, the majority of classrooms are located in somewhat decrepit modular training uh, or modular trailers. Um, Here's some views of the existing firing ranges where you can see water across the training facility. And this is where officers will stand to train. Uh, here's a view of their wood shop. You can see water creeping in towards their existing facilities. Um, here's some other views of the, the site around where you can kind of see overgrowth as well as, you know, just the, the kind of decrepit nature of the site. Um, and lastly, here's a view of the mess hall, which is a building that we will be replacing as a part of our proposed scheme. Uh, currently, this mess hall is where officers go to check in for the site. It's the main uh, nexus for the existing facility, and it is in disrepair and incredibly overgrown. So in summary, the site is in need of new facilities to bring the NYPD uh, a state-of-the-art training facility, and that is what we're hoping to provide. Um, so here's a view of our proposed scheme. Um, uh, in short, one of the first things that we'll be bringing is new upgraded sanitary and upgraded utilities to the site. 
We will have a facility services building, which will be the, the, the building which takes in these new services and redirects it across the site. We will have upgraded parking with bioswales and water retention to help manage some of the, the site water runoff to mediate the existing standing water. Uh, we will be regrading the entire site. Uh, some locations will be higher and other locations will be lower to these bioswales and water remediation zones. Uh, the first building that you see here, building number three on the site is our two-story mess hall bathroom locker room facility. Uh, this building will uh, is the main nexus for the site. It's the, the central node for connecting um, officers coming to train to the training facilities. Uh, we will have an 150 indoor firing range and classroom, as well as miscellaneous storage for uh, the firearms and tactics uh, uh, staff. So moving closer into a campus, zoo, campus scale, um, you can see that we have the mess hall, indoor fire range, storage buildings, and facility services. The flows and circulations around the site have now been centralized. Uh, the, the mess hall once again acts as the central node, but it, it actually acts as a wayfinding device for sending officers who are coming to train to their training destination, either in the uh, indoor firing range or the classrooms. Uh, it also acts as a as a wayfinding device for the staff. Um, this is where their locker rooms and their break room and uh, stress relief spaces will be located. Another key component uh, of this site is maintaining access to, for the bomb squads emergency route, which you can see in yellow. So there's several different kinds of circulation flows that are thought of when laying out this site. Uh, moving forward, we'll talk about the mess hall first. Uh, the, on the ground level, the mess hall is a utilities and support with both indoor and outdoor bathrooms and a cafeteria for officers coming to, you know, to wait and train, but also have lunch or breakfast. Uh, on the second floor, we will have locker rooms, stress relief and break areas. The massing of the building to comply with Local Law 94 features a sloped green roof. Uh, this, this is carefully being, uh, we're carefully looking at how different materials will play in with this, but the green roof offers a vegetative area to manage, uh, to help manage some of the, the runoff and rainwater, uh, it, as well as bringing a bright green space to the, to the facility. Uh, from a massing and material standpoint, we're looking at a, a site palette of similar materials. And these materials include masonry and or precast panel, curtain wall and storefront glazing, both opaque and translucent polycarbonate, as well as a sloped green roof. And as we get into the other buildings, I'll talk about some other materials we're using throughout the site, but we're using this as a, as a, as a site palette across to, to have similar types of uh, forms, but materials across the site. Oh. Slow. So the mess hall is connected. Oops. It's, there we go. I don't know why it's lagging, but it is. Sometimes there can be a delay, so just okay. take it yeah. slow. I'm, I'm patient. So the mess hall and uh, indoor firing range are connected by a, an open courtyard. This, is, this courtyard is really the heart of the campus. It's a location for uh, officers waiting to train, uh, waiting be between classrooms and training um, kinds of things. And it also is a covered lunch area. And it also serves as a muster zone for officers waiting in formation before they enter the site. So this is a, mi a mixture of both permeable and porous landscapes, but it also has some, uh, it, it has to be a robust surface for the amount of pedestrians that will come to and from the site and circulate across the campus. Uh, the ground level of the mess hall is a cafeteria and kitchen, as well as utility services. Uh, right off the front entryway, we'll have a check-in station for officers queuing, checking in, and then receiving their instructions to go to the site. We will bo have both indoor uh, and outdoor uh, bathroom facilities for the site to service both officers in the mess hall, but also officers throughout. On the second floor, we will have locker rooms. And these locker rooms are for the training staff at Rodman's Neck. Uh, 
officers coming to train will not access the second floor. This is a floor mainly just for the staff at the facility. We all have a stress relief area for officers for weightlifting and um, you know, fitness training and a break area. Some key features about the mess hall are since the, on the second floor, we're redirecting views towards Pelham uh, Bay Park, as well as across the peninsula to uh, the Bronx. That's in the break area and stress relief zones. Those are the more public facing portions of the second floor. Uh, and additionally, we'll have a sloped green roof, which helps manage some of the uh, site water runoff. Here's some elevation views, the polycarbonate, masonry, and curtain wall glazing. As we wrap around the building, this is the front entry point for the facility. These are the main entry doors. Uh, the second building I'm going to talk about today is the indoor firing range cl classrooms. And this is conceived as uh, a ballistic box for firearms training with a lightweight construction classroom bar. Uh, we're using the duality of the ballistic box, which is a contained precast element with this idea of lightweight construction on the outside. And this inf is informed in the building materials and uh, views that you'll see. We will additionally have a sloped green roof on the classroom bar and solar panels, uh, as well as mechanical units on the precast ballistic box. Uh, these HVAC, HVAC units are critical to the function of the space to take away um, harmful lead dust from the interior. So some views of the organization, we have the indoor firing ranges and the classroom bar. The classroom is oriented towards the courtyard and mess hall and features views towards the outside, views towards the corridor. It's creating a connection between these two buildings. Moving forward. Uh, and then the roof again, it features solar panels and green roof to comply with local law 94. Here's some views where we can see uh, some a, a new site material, which is actually going to be prevalent across the site on other buildings, which is a horizontal oriented corrugated metal panel. And then a precast facade for the ballistic box. We're working with our facade designers front on detailing the, these facade elements. And we will bring more information in our uh, future submissions to you on the uh, either decorative finish or, or panels for that facade. Um, Moving forward. So here's some site materials from previous Smith Miller and Hawkinson projects that we will utilize uh, on this site. These are materials picked for their durability. Um, and in some cases they offer uh, two different types of things. So in the top, we see our Zurega Avenue EMS station, which has both polycarbonate and curtain wall glazing as well as masonry. This is a view for, from the interior looking through the polycarbonate. Um, and then we'll also have some standing seam metal roofs that, that are sloped to comply with Local Law 94. Uh, the standing seam we're using as a design element to transfer from the roof to the facade. Uh, and then finally, we will have both precast decorative elements and horizontal oriented corrugated metal panel on the uh, ancillary buildings. So moving forward, our landscape strategy uh, is conceived as a performative landscape that manages storm water and provides much needed shade where appropriate. Uh, we're using native and adapted shade trees, shrubs and ornamental and perennial plantings in these zones. Like I said before, site water and runoff is a key element in the design. And so a high element or what we're calling the zone of functional landscape is around the, both the mess hall, storage building and um, indoor firing range. What the site is sloped away from these, these locations closer to the existing conditions on the perimeter where we will have bioswells as well as coordinated site water runoff. Um, I have Stephen Ledoughty who can answer any more technical questions on our landscape stra strategy. Um, some kinds of site materials that we're using, of course, are the green roof. Uh, these are views from our Zurega Avenue EMS station, as well as asphalt and crushed permeable, either uh, it could be recycled tires or gravel. Uh, these create kinds of zones of hard to permeable and we'll most likely use these materials around buildings. 
Um, additionally, we will have bioswales with meadow-like plantings and native species, as well as striped areas for uh, directing and wayfinding uh, of pedestrians on the site. Some additional kinds of landscape elements of bioswales and plantings, as well as some sort of urban infill of what we're thinking about for the, the, uh, the mess hall courtyard. These are some views of how these systems work. Moving forward, uh, and here's some three-dimensional views, uh, rendered views to see the site as a whole. We have, once again, the indoor firing range here with the sloped green roof classroom bar, views oriented towards the courtyard, the two-story mess hall bathroom locker room facility, uh, which connects both to the existing parking or the new parking and the courtyard spaces. Oops, did I miss a view? Uh, here's a view coming into the entry. Uh, as you enter the facility, you'll see the firing range on the left, but you'll be directed uh, towards the mess hall, which is, as I said before, the wayfinding and central node of the campus. More views. Here's a view from the parking lot towards the mess hall. You'll be brought from the parking lot to the mess hall or the indoor firing range. Uh, some more aerial views of the whole site, site as a whole. Um, some elements that I didn't mention earlier were the uh, newly provided or re relocated NYPD trailers. These buildings are outside of the scope of this project. Those are will be handled by the NYPD separate. Separately, um, additionally, there are all of the other existing facilities are outside the scope, such as the Department of Corrections or the HITA um, training facility. And lastly, we have some model views. We've been studying models and in, uh, in, in massings and in, in the office as ways of thinking of the site as a whole and similar kinds of design features. Um, we have some ancillary buildings that I'd be happy to go through if you have questions. Uh, these buildings are support functions for the site, storage building and facility services. They feature standing seam metal roofs, which I'll just go quickly. Standing seam metal roofs as well as horizontal oriented uh, corrugated metal panel. Um, these buildings are, have a similar site material palette and similar forms and they will help house the, the storage needs of the entire site. Um, as well as the pump station. Uh, I'd be happy to go through these in more detail if you have questions. Um, but with that being said, we're excited to uh, move forward with this project and uh, please let me know if you have questions. Uh, thank you very much, Alex. It's, it's good to see, uh, uh, I feel as if this facility has sort of grown like Topsy over the years. Uh, and with very little sort of uh, certainly architectural coordination. So it's good to see that you're able to take a pretty sizable chunk of the uh, of all of the facilities and create a, a language that will uh, unify it in a very straightforward, cost-effective, uh, low maintenance kind of way. And yet, you know, there's an elegance to the form uh, and the juxtaposition of materials. So, I'm, I'm very appreciative of that. Um, I guess this is a technical question for um, the representative from Langen. Um, uh, obviously the, the amount of standing water on the site is somewhat horrifying uh, as well as it's uh, you know, low lying condition. I just wondered what your uh, soil tests are showing relative to percolation and whether uh, you feel as if the sort of uh, number or extent of the bioswales uh, is adequate for the what what you're observing on the site today. I'll, I'll get to you in a second, Susan. See your hand. So, so based on the uh, oh, is there, there's an echo. Um, based on the layout that we have shown the schematic design, those uh, square footages are based on providing. Uh, code required uh, areas of uh, infiltration for the uh, bioswales and storm for stormwater treatment. So my understanding, and I'm not, I, I know the site civil from our uh, firm is not on the phone right now, but those those areas were sized according to the to the requirements for stormwater. Um, in terms of the existing soils on site, we do know that we're we're in a shoreline condition. The soils are sandy. Um, in terms of test results, I I'm not familiar with. Um, the exact drainage properties of those soils and uh, we can follow up, but we do know that it's sandier soils on the site 
and um, that we're, we're pretty confident based on this level and, and schematic design that the uh, there'll be percolation in those areas. Yeah, I guess my question was, I'm sure you followed the the code, um, but I guess did you do anything more than just what the code requires because the site seems to have a pretty significant problem. Yeah, so uh, above and beyond the code, which you see in the parking lot areas, that's where those bioswales are. We do have other open areas uh, to the south of the, of the um, storage building where we see that as additional uh, open space. Uh, so you can maybe Alex can point that area out there uh, uh, just to the right of that roadway right, right in there. Those are um, additional open areas that we could expand stormwater um, uh, treatment in, but it's uh, we envision that area to be more of a native uh, uh, grass and um, and trees in that area, and that's an opportunity to uh, expand uh, above and beyond the, the stormwater requirements. Great, thank you, thank you, um, Susan. You, it it just got answered. Great, no further Great. question. I guess I have one more question. You know, renderings are a little hard to gauge exactly in terms of scale. Uh, but I, I wonder, it looked like in some of those images, the, the road widths look pretty wide. And I wondered what was the, like that image in particular, yeah. um, what was the kind of criteria that you were given uh, to accommodate? So there's several criteria for road width. Um, on the site, like I said, one of the key aspects, if we, I'm gonna, do I have control? I'm gonna uh, I go do, back I to the- I can control, Alex. Okay, great. I'd like to go back to the site flows just to talk about it a little bit more. Um, we will have to maintain bomb squad access. This is a site where in an emergency, the bomb squad will come as a detonation zone. Um, in addition, we will have several emergency required um, uh, you know, like if a fire truck needs to come through. Uh, additionally, this is a fueling center for some of the site. So the, the 30 foot aisles are for mediating all of these large uh, vehicles that will come to the site. Um, we, we have much more, you know, narrower roads within the parking lot, but the 30 foot was a requirement for the code for emergency access around the buildings, but also to the peninsula. Okay, understood. Uh, any other commissioners uh, care to weigh in? Um, I have a question for the design team. Um, I see that the site is is very much zoned and managed uh, in the plan that you the kind of um, programmatic plan that you showed. Alex was very helpful, and given that uh, you know, and I agree with Signe that it's it's. Um, wonderful to see this campus uh, um, brought into a kind of elegance and 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 um, intuitive circulation um, that that the use deserves and given that all of our NYPD officers I understand have to be there twice a year I'm wondering if there are opportunities I see that you have the courtyard but I'm wondering, uh, Alex, if you could speak to whether there are more opportunities to allow our officers in training to uh, connect with what is a spectacular, Rodman's Neck is a, almost like singularly spectacular in the landscape of our city. And given that we know, uh, as a matter of fact, that access to nature is uh, um, very healing in, let's say like a medical setting, but also for, uh, our officers who are in uh, often very stressful situations, I wonder if that wouldn't be a, a good kind of programmatic activity to incorporate or if, it, if, if possible. Yeah, we will take that into consideration as we continue to develop. One of the, you know, one of the key things that I think um, that I mentioned on previously is the existing conditions and maintaining operations during construction. We actually have an incredibly limited footprint of available area for building construction. And so we'll continue to develop with uh, Stephen and Lang and this courtyard space as well as other outside venues for connecting with nature. Um, but one of the key things that I think um, should be mentioned is 
the site is, uh, you know, coming to the site, you have to drive through uh, Pelham Bay Park. So on your journey into the site, you enter a, this park and then you come to a traffic circle and you drive through the park the entire journey to the facility. Uh, and so the, the, in its essence, it is connected to the park throughout, uh, but we will continue to look out, look at additional outdoor spaces for, you know, this furthering this connection to the existing park. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any other commissioners? I just wanted to be clear about, uh, because it's still not like, is, is the facility in the new design with all the new grading and the swales, will this withstand a hundred year event? So thank you for that question. The facility has been designed to the new CRDG guidelines. Uh, we are pilot program within that, uh, that program. And so that means that we actually, and this could answer earlier questions, we are above, above the code minimums for our DFE at the designated flood elevation. We will be DFE plus 40 inches. Mm. Uh, so that means that all of the buildings, our new buildings brought to the site are actually housed at what's called 17.33, essentially 40 inches above the FEMA recommended uh, elevation. Um, so, We've designed our new facilities to, to meet these requirements, as well as you know, really focusing on how site water and runoff will be connected to the existing peninsula. But our new, our new programs are raised to this elevation. And, and so specifically, if there is a 100 year event, these buildings will survive that? Yes. Great, thank you. That's, that's fabulous to hear. Plus 40 inches. That's good. That's good. Yes. It's a, it, it requires careful coordination with our, our civil as the existing site is actually much lower. I, I can imagine. Um, any other commissioners? If, again, I can't see the full screen of people. Um, if not, um, thank you very much for that uh, uh, presentation. And uh, this will be, uh, I believe, on the, uh, no, it will not be on the consent agenda, excuse me, um, but that is our last uh, committee item uh, for today. So uh, thank you very much. This concludes our committee meeting. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, thank you. So we will now uh, begin the public meeting with a vote on the consent agenda. Uh, today we are, uh, looking at um, items 27919 to 27946. Uh, please note my recusal and Commissioner Miranda's recusal on items 27931 and 27932. My recusal and Commissioner Martin's recusal on item 27935 and Commissioner Sheffer's uh, recusal on item 27940. Are there any other recusals uh, that have not been noted? Uh, no, let the record show there are no uh, further recusals. So I will now call for a vote commissioners. When I call your name, please state your vote for the consent agenda. Bill Ahrens. Approval. Ken Seth. Uh, approval, except I will ex abstain for 27935. The boathouse. No, she never called us. Uh, uh, Lori, have you rejoined us? Um, no. she, she's well, joining um, now. We're trying to admit her. I'll, I'll come back to her. Um, Deborah? No. Approval. Thank you, Karen? Approval. Manuel? Approval. Susan? Approval. Ethel? I'm getting her to leave. I want to smell so she can make a decision if she has Ethel, you're muted. I don't care about that. No one's talking about Yes, approval. Thank you, Ethel. Meryl? Approval. Thank you. And Lori, are you back? I'm back. Approval with the, yeah, approval. Thank you. And myself, um, approve all. So the um, consent agenda passes. Um, so we will now move on to the public hearing with item number 27947, the installation of an artwork, Flexus, 
at the Harper Street Yard in Queens. Whomever is here, uh, please feel free to begin. I'm gonna share my screen. Can we unmute Green Vanessa and also um, Dara in case I need to discuss the share with him, promote with him. Hello? Yes. Hello. Good morning. Everyone hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Dara, I'm going to give you control so that you can advance the slides on behalf of her, Vanessa. Okay, perfect. Okay. Are we starting now? Yeah, Grimanessa, is it possible to turn on your video? Uh, I think it's on. Let me see. Let me just go. Okay, I'm doing it right now. Oh, thank you. Perfect. Great. Okay, and Dara, I've given you control. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Are we are all yes. ready? Yes. Okay, perfect. Thank you, Grace. So, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Grimanesa Moros, and I'm going to be presenting today my conceptual design presentation for the asphalt um, plant. And as we have our time is very tight, I'm gonna, with any further delays, I'm gonna be starting. First with my past previous work, uh, the one that you have now in the screen, it's uh, Racimo. This was done, uh, it's a permanent piece outdoors and it was um, done in Turku in Finland in 2010. Uh, this project uh, was under the Central Park Bridge uh, for uh, Allure of the Seas. The next one will be Golden Waters, and this was, um, uh, it was sponsored by the city of Scottsdale and the Scottsdale Public Art as well. And it's a light sculpture installation that is on the canal of the Scottsdale, which is about 50 miles waterfront. And I, I selected the area with Paolo Soleri I made uh, one of his latest uh, wonderful um, projects before uh, he pa passed away. The next one, um, well, um, it's a detail, you know, aerial view, of course, of um, for you to see the magnitude and how uh, large uh, monumental really was the piece and it was on the canal itself. Uh, the next one will be a uh, project that it was at Pro Pro Prospect Park, and it was uh, commissioned by BRIC, you know, to celebrate their 40th anniversary, besides as well um, running parallel to the Brooklyn Festival every summer. And this was uh, also installed in the area where it was the Prospect Park Banshell in Brooklyn. Uh, the name of the piece was Hedera, due to a lot of development and research that I did for the park when I realized that the magnitude, amazing amount of um, ivies that they were running throughout uh, the bridge. And I thought that it was a very well connection with the architecture, you know, the park and the bureau itself. And that's where the names comes from uh, Edera, uh, Latin. And this was one of the latest uh, projects that I have just completed. It's about, uh, it might be difficult to see in a slide, but it's about three blocks and about maybe uh, four, um, about six steps on the, on the, of a building. And the next one would be, uh, that was, I forgot to mention that it was in Mumbai in India. And this was a um, project that it was for the Peninsula Hotel. And it was uh, installed in the landmark facade of uh, the building. And it was also part of the um, Art of Pink, uh, an international breast cancer awareness month that they have always in September every year. It's an, uh, it's an arts initiative. And it was also sponsored by the Peninsula Hotels uh, Worldwide. Uh, um, the last slide, it's a project that it is down, down here on 80 Y Street. And this is, um, was a new specific commission by the uh, Bronze Museum for the AIM program, uh, it was another satellite that they will be having in Lower Manhattan for the fellow um, uh, artists to be able to be part of the program and perhaps don't have to travel all the way to the to the Bronx. 
with, uh, we're going to continue to see some of the, just three samples of the lighting sequence, and they are very short. This, they're about 10 seconds each. I'll let you see it and enjoy it. And if you have any further questions, I'm gonna be uh, you know, very glad to be able to answer it later. This particular um, uh, piece was also, when they was in Times Square, I had also all of the lighting of the outdoors of all LCD screens in uh, Times Square. Then we are now gonna be uh, going to see the uh, Flexus itself, you know, the, the project, which for me was, uh, I, I was thinking about how was I gonna amplify the magic of, you know, the neighborhood. And really my goal was to make them uh, reimagine and, you know, the structures uh, a, a, a communication that we're going to be having it with um, the sustainability and the efforts, you know, that I wanted to have to really preserve the characteristic and environment of the city of New York. Um, the piece is going to definitely be seen from all the drivers from all the highways that they are surrounding the asphalt plant, which we are going to be seeing afterwards the location. And the program will be a lighting sequence about 10, 15 minutes on very different hues and intensities that we are going to be seeing will be very shortly. And by, by, the, by doing this, I thought that I was gonna be the parallel, you know, city's pulse and energy, you know, together with uh, the neighborhood. Uh, the next slide, you'll see that that was my first um, selection for uh, the slide for my first panel proposal for the project. And now the, um, we're gonna be seeing about five slides how and where is location lo lo located, you know, and the map of the whole borough. The next one, please. Mm -hmm. These are actually uh, real images of the photographs of the site, you know, that I took on different, uh, you know, all around, 360, because that's the way you're going to be seeing the, the piece, right? This is, you know, the existing plan that we have right now, at this time. And this is another slide where you're going to be able to see the location specifically of the tanks and the silos. This is a better, this is a detail. This is the tanks and the silos schematic elevation drawings. As you see, there's quite, uh, the tanks are much quite uh, higher. And then, um, I've, you know, this, it was very important, this slide for all to know that after much discussions, I was able to talk with Standstill with their producing the tanks and the silos to be able to paint a, a matte uh, paint gray for the surface, which it was part, it was not uh, any additional expense. It was part of the um, color that they gave me to choose. This one, we are gonna be seeing all the photometric light studies for the light intensity and the placement of the light features, you know, in this case, um, the basically the intensity, right, of placement. You have seen before the tanks, and now we are going to be seeing, you know, the uh, the tanks, and then the other one was the silos, as you could see by the um, this one here, all the equipment that I'm gonna be utilizing for the artwork. In the next three slides, we are gonna be seeing different uh, studies that I made at the studio with equipment that I was gonna see to see how the light was gonna be uh, transferring. Uh, 
And of course, you know, the light color palette, the white, the golds, and the teals are, you know, uh, there are really millions of colors to really select. So I just did this, selected these two um, color palettes for you to have an idea as to which colors I might be, I might be use, using. This is gonna be a very uh, short animation video to see how subtle the light is gonna be changing. You know, from one color to another one, right? The transfer of color. So it, it's gonna be very thoughtful for uh, the, the community. I'm not gonna be having these, you know, shining reds or blues or, you know, disco type of thing. These are just the light fixture structure options that I have, you know, for the, uh, the silos. Another one we do actually gonna see how they're being mounted on the structure of the AC tanks, right? This is the, um, the drawing of the AC tanks, the containment units where I will be putting the lights, you know, on the side. This is the drawing of the light fixtures. And here, of course, we have all the uh, hours of operation um, that we have been, you know, discussing with DOT. Uh, at the end, you know, um, they're gonna be deciding how many hours and for what time to the other. Uh, some, and then I wanna make a, a note and a very important point for me that I'm aware of the CUNES Community Board request you know, for the project, uh, you know, to really have a look into the mitigation of the measures to reduce the impacts to the wildlife, you know, uh, due to the light components of the art project. And then, uh, of course, you know, we have to um, be very thoughtful and practical about the maintenance, you know, of the equipment that have been uh, truly taken in consideration, very thoughtfully as well. And then this is, we are gonna be going out through some uh, renderings and some, this is an aerial, you know, day, during the day. And this is an area night rendering. And then, then the next would be the, this is a night rendering, but from the viewer's perspective, right? Like from the Harper Street and Flushing Bay Promenade. Mm -hmm. This is another right uh, rendering for different, you know, from different angles. And um, I want to share with you the, uh, the rendering, which is not long. It's only one minute at 40 sec 42 seconds. I also wanted to make a, a little note that 
this project is actually quite special for me. I can't believe that I have the opportunity to um, make a piece as growing up, um, my father worked in an asphalt uh, plant and uh, he would take me every weekend, you know? So my play playground actually was an asphalt plant, so. As you see, the sequence of the lighting has been changing in a very, very subtle, right? I don't know, and uh, with this is, you know, uh, the end of my presentation. And I don't know if any of the, you know, members attending today have any questions. Um, thank you so much for that. But before um, the commissioners uh, uh, ask questions, um, we, uh, I need to ask whether anyone has signed up to give public testimony, but I'll just say, I thought it was very beautiful. But, thank you so much. Um, uh, Carrie? Hi, uh, Signe. Uh, just as a reminder, we are hearing public testimony today only on the item that is on the public hearing agenda. We are not hearing testimony on other items. That said, we have one person who has signed up to give testimony. Uh, that would be Todd Fine. So I will unmute him now. And there are three, three minutes. Yes, hello. Um, I'm Todd Fine. I'm the president of the Washington Free Advocacy Group, which advocates for public parks in New York City. I'd like to say first that asphalt plants are known for Wait, Todd, I'm sorry, you muted for a second. Okay. Yes, I was saying asphalt plants are known for producing toxic air pollutants, including arsenic, benzene, formaldehyde, and cadmium which cause cancer, central nervous problems, liver damage, respiratory problems, and skin irritation. On top of that, bright lights are well known for causing environmental damage to plants, uh, to, to animals, insects, also to, to the local community, which may not want to have bright lights on top of a poisonous plant uh, in their neighborhood. Now, the fact that I'm once again, the only person testifying on this matter shows the lack of community, you know, outreach or even engagement on this sort of bold initiative, which you would expect would have more public input. There has been a persistent issue at the Percent to Art program about not engaging communities. There had to be reform legislation. And we pick an artist who doesn't have any justification of why this light work is relevant to the community or why bringing attention with colorful lights to a poisonous plant is in the, the interest of New York City. I think it's sort of a perverse environmental justice statement, which just brings, once again, brings kind of, turns the city into a city of attractions, tries to take something that's poisonous and make it a spectacle. And it's it's sort of, it's consistent with New York's corporatization, spectacleization, colored uh, LED lights being an end of themselves. Now, I find it disturbing. Also, the fact that there are, this item has no comment, while there are other items on the agenda, which have, massive desire for comment, including a boathouse, the Jefferson statue. There, this public design commission is not, is not, and the city's programs in general are failing to get input on the things that people do desire about. And then the things that people want to talk about, they're not allowed to. Thank you. Um, could, could I be able to answer? Hello? Sorry, yes. I, I just want to make a statement. We, the public design commission, had a public hearing on both the Thomas Jefferson statue relocation via loan and the Sherman Creek Boathouse projects. Uh, yes, ma'am, you can you can respond. Okay, so is um, thank you very much for your comment. I truly appreciate it. Um, in in through the years that I have been involved, you know, doing public work, I think that one of the very very important facts for me has been the con connecting with the community, right? I'm originally from Peru and I came here as an immigrant in 1984 with two bags and many, many, many dreams. And the reason why I know Queens is because I actually live in every single neighborhood, starting with Jamaica. So here you have an artist, right? That actually knows Queens very, very, very much. You have another, another little addition, which is that I practically grew in an asphalt plant Thank God I am 59 years old and thank God 
hopefully so far, you know, I don't have any cancers whatsoever. Now, I am very excited because this is my opportunity to actually work with the asphalt plan, the DOT, they're really making a truly effort for doing environmental changes. You know, sometimes they're not done from one day to the other, but little steps, you know, adds to it. Now, that's what I made a little comment, which is says, I don't pretend to put a disco light there with like they put us sometimes on the bridges, red, blue, green. No, these are very specific inspired colors of the community around. I never ever in the story of my work have ever had one member of any community on all levels saying that they didn't embrace the work. Now, with, with DOT, right, I am sure that they are working seriously to change any type of pollutions that in general, modern life and living in a city as New York has, right? We are trying to work it. We are trying to work for the best. And so I am aware about all the no's that you have brought and, but they are always, hello? Hello? I don't know. Can hear you. Okay, yes. So yeah. that's what I, you know, that's what I wanted to have those points very important. You see, you're working with an artist that I am not in Lululand. I'm very practical and logical. I'm so grateful that my other side of my brain, besides the creative, is also working. So I am taking in consideration, and that's the reason what I wanted to make, you know, the planet itself without putting something, you know, egotistic for me, a sculpture, and then put it just chanted there. Okay, I'm gonna put here, you know, Grimanesa Moros. No, 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 no. That's not what it's about. It's about how you could change the perspective you know, and the view of others, right? How do you make their life better? And you will say, okay, Grimanesa, how are you gonna make with these lights the life better of the community? Well, that's really, we don't know, right? We have to try it. I am sure that we could even, you know, um, do education programs, you know, about how we could, you know, uh, how roads are made and, and, you know, I, I would personally be very interested to keep on working with DOT to, you know, to um, inform the community as to what is an asphalt plant. You know, like I said, I go back to my father working an asphalt plant for over 50 years, and I grew up there every single weekend. You know, I, I don't know, it's funny because in our times, you know, we, were, we used to run freely. I could have gone and be probably, you know, cemented there with the, you know, with all the materials there, but you know, it was quite interesting and I learned a lot. So in, in general, I would like to finish by saying, yes, life is between, you know, uh, it's a balance, right? You know, they have every, nothing is really perfect. So, but we as teams, as many, many teams here, we have to work together to make something different, right? And that's the reason what I'm working with light. I am actually involved in other projects in Frankfurt and other places about how important is the light. And the project that we did in Scottsdale, for example, in the canal, that was incredible because it brought fauna, you know, like different algae, and it brought fishes to a canal that it was an existence of having fishes. So you never know how, obviously, work things in the future. I wish we have like a little magic ball that we could see things. We just got to try to do our best, our 100%, you know, and, but this is very important, you know, for me to know um, what do you think? So I truly, truly appreciate it, you know, to have heard, you know, your concerns because obviously nobody wants to die from cancers and all the other diseases that there are out there. Uh, if it's anything that I have is more respect for the community, as I said, I knew every single neighborhood in Queens, you name it, I have been there, you know, uh, living and also trying, you know, the wonderful culture, the restaurants and so, and we could go so on. But I, the time of all the people that are hearing me is very precious to me. So I think that I, you know, conclude a little bit, you know, how I want to answer to that, um, I wouldn't say a question, but you know, the, the ideas that you might have for uh, the plan. Thank you so much. 
Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, Carrie, has anyone else signed up to testify? We do not have anyone else signed up to testify for this project. Um, if there are, this is conceptual. So of course the artist will, and the team will develop the proposal and it will be resubmitted for preliminary. If members of the public have comment on this specific project, uh, they can send them to us at the design commission uh, via email or um, yeah, via email at, um, Grace, what is our email address? Design commission. Design commission, one word, at cityhall.nyc.gov. Thank you. Sorry. Okay, go ahead, Signe. Thank you. Would any um, commissioners like to uh, uh, speak about this proposal? I, I, I have my hand up. Uh, okay, Ethel, please. Thanks. I just want to say very quickly, first of all, appreciate and there's no underestimating ever the uh, environmental effects or, or the unanticipated environmental effects of uh, modern or long lasting industrial uses. And I'm sure that responsibility is being exercised. I found this and I want to just say the two sentences, extremely innovative and inspiring. And I, I really, uh, found it to be something of great interest and I think a very positive. And so I look forward uh, to the continued working by the artists and by the community on this because I think it can be something of very great interest and perhaps even inspiration in the future. And um, I'd like to echo uh, Ethel's comments. I think it's a beautiful proposal. And I think it's inspiring hearing you talk about it and your personal engagement um, with the project um, and the site. And uh, I look forward to um, looking at um, uh, that concrete plant in a wholly different way um, as I drive by it, which is I think somewhat frequently. And uh, I greatly appreciate the thoughtfulness um, that you um, brought um, to the project. It's really um, inspiring. Um, and I think the result will be beautiful. Thank you, Phil. Uh, any other commissioners care to weigh in? Ken Seth, are you with us? Perhaps not. Um, I, I am. I was having a bit of a lag. Oh, video. sorry. But um, I, I don't have anything substantive to add to this um, proposal. And I think the artist has spoken well for themselves. And uh, I mean, there's never going to be an artwork that's made that isn't uh, critiqued. Uh, and some people will be for it and some people will be against it. Uh, but I think the main thrust of this is that the heroic scale of this previously inelegant site has been uh, transformed into, uh, I don't know exactly the word, but, uh, but has, been, has been transformed into, in, in, into something that on, on par with ballet. So now we have a site that was at night going to be completely dead, regardless of any of the social and environmental impacts of what it was, it will now have a second life that is poetic in the evening and night. So in that way, I think that it contributes to uh, what would have been derelict. And that is not any hardship on the community. So that's what I would say. Well stated, Kenseth. Thank you. Um, all right, well, I will just, if there are no further uh, uh, comments or questions, uh, from the commissioners. Phil, I see you on the screen. Did you want to add something else? Okay. No. Um, can never quite figure all of this out. Um, so just to uh, uh, summarize, I, I believe that there were um, some uh, comments also contributed by the community board uh, with regard to uh, uh, studying, uh, further studying light pollution. Uh, and if there are any concerns 
uh, with either bird nesting, uh, bird flight patterns, uh, and such. So this is a conceptual presentation, as Carrie stated. Uh, this will be back uh, to us uh, and uh, an opportunity for uh, folks to, again, uh, raise any uh, concerns uh, and the public as well. Uh, so we, uh, I think our, uh, this is to the artist and to DCLA. Uh, I think that the majority of uh, commissioners are very supportive of the sensitivity uh, uh, being applied to this project, uh, to the kind of uh, transformation of an industrial, I don't wanna call it an artifact, because it's actually a living thing. I mean, it's it utilized. Um, into something that uh, that makes it uh, uh, gives it some presence and hopefully some uh, uh, identity for the community in the uh, in the evening hours. Uh, so uh, I think that is the uh, our our recommendation uh, moving forward. So we will now take a vote on this. Uh, it is a roll call on item two seven nine four seven. Commissioners, when I call your name, please state uh, your vote uh, for, against, or um, uh, abstain. Phil Ahrens? Approve. Ken Seth Armstead? Approve. Lori Hawkinson? She might have left. No, you? approved. Thank you, Lori. Uh, Deborah Martin? Approve. Karen Keel? Approve. Manuel Miranda? Approve. Susan Morgenthau? Approve. Ethel Sheffer? Approve. Thank you. Uh, Meryl Tisch? Maybe not. Uh, and I also approve. Uh, so that is uh, unanimous, regardless of whether um, uh, Meryl submits her vote. Uh, so uh, let the record show that uh, we are all in favor. Uh, the project is approved um, with, with the conditions uh, stated previously. And with that, the public meeting is now adjourned. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, one and all. Thank you.